Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this Red Gaming Citicon video, we're going to be discussing and analyzing tech news, which, as usual, popped up over the past 24 or so hours. We're going to be starting things out with the GeForce 20 series, aka Turing. Specifically, further details from the interview that Tom Peterson had with the folks over at Hot Hardware. So, a number of details have emerged from that interview since it was originally put up. One of those is the explanation of DLSS, or a, an additional piece of information of DLSS anyway. So DLSS is the ability for the GPU to upsample an image. So for sake of argument, let's say it renders natively at 1080p, the hardware will then be able to upsample that to something like, let's say, 4K. The idea here is simple. It allows more of the work to be placed on the tensor cores and will allow the GPU to run at higher frame rates compared to what it would be if it was rendering the images natively. But originally it was unveiled that developers would need to provide samples of the game code to NVIDIA and then they would use their internal ridiculously high-end GPUs to do the calculations and then you would be able to download a few megabytes depending on the game, and that would enable that game to support DLSS. Although there is a way for developers to actually create their own custom algorithms, and this would be running natively on the tensor cores. So in short, rather than submitting the code once again to NVIDIA, and then for NVIDIA to do it, the tensor cores can handle it themselves. There is not much information on the performance difference here, so we can only wait and assume that it's probably going to be slower but perhaps there's going to be better quality performance or whatever else. After all, there must be one reason or another for developers to choose that. Perhaps it will be more accurate. Perhaps it's easier for developers to uh, plonk in. Although NVIDIA do say that they can, uh, that is developers can submit games to run and be uh, support DLSS for free anyway on their own hardware. We also have further information when it comes to NVLink. So a quick reminder then, SLI has, of course, been part of NVIDIA's GPUs for a number of years now, since the shift to PCIe. Uh, originally, of course, we saw SLI being supported by NVIDIA's 3DFX lineup, like the Voodoo 2s. But NVIDIA then gobbled up 3DFX and then used SLI, if only for the name and the branding. But one of the issues with... Uh, SLI is, of course, you can have uh, frame pacing issues and so on and so on. So one of the things we did see from NVIDIA's SIGGRAPH conference, specifically when Jensen Huang was discussing Quadro, was the ability for the GPUs to share memory pools. So let's say you had one graphics card that was 8 gigabytes of RAM and another graphics card that was also 8 gigabytes of RAM. When they were linked with NVLink, you would not have just a single pool of 8 gigabytes. Instead, it would be 16 gigabytes because the data was not precisely mirrored between the two GPUs. And one of the reasons behind this is because NVLink has considerably higher memory bandwidth, so the two cards can swap data. When asked, whether this would it be possible for the GeForce cards, it was kind of an ambiguous statement. He said, while this is true that it's a memory-to-memory -memory link, I don't think it's going to be magically doubling the frame buffer. It's more nuanced than that today. It's going to take time for people to understand how people think of MGPU setup, and maybe they look at different techniques. NVLink is laying the foundation for future MGPU setups. And with regards to the frame pacing issue, uh, Tom Peterson stated that they were looking into that, they were looking into alternate rendering approaches, but he wasn't ready to disclose this information yet. So for owners who are looking to get perhaps a couple of graphics cards, let's say a couple of RTX 2080s, it's possible in, let's say, one month, two months, three months, six months, who knows, that NVIDIA will make this a more smooth experience, a better experience, perhaps because of the bandwidth for the NVLink. But once again, it's a bit of a hard sell for you to say, well, if you do buy these two cards, it will be an issue that's resolved. With that said, a lot of developers haven't really been pushing MGPU as much recently, 
But that's not to say it's not part and parcel of, let's say, DirectX 12, which does heavily support it. It's just going to be interesting to see how all of this takes shape over the next several months and if developers do choose to support this. So what about performance then? What about clock speeds? Well, yesterday we did tackle the fact that NVIDIA are confirming that we're going to be seeing around a 35 to a 45% jump from one generation to another. If you want more information on that, you can click on the link, of course, found in the description of this video. But crucially, um, Tom also pointed out that he's seen many Founders Edition cards hit 2.1 gigahertz. There is one thing he admitted to tell us though, and that is what about the memory clock speeds? Well, actually there's two things. And the second thing is whether this was from the pre-overclocked versions of the card. As you know, those have a 90 megahertz advantage compared to the unstandard uh, vanilla cousins. Does that mean we're gonna have like, you know, 2000 megahertz for the vanilla cards and 2100 megahertz for the overclocked models. Does that not really make any difference ultimately? Is it possible that you can BIOS flash or you know tweak the GPUs to get extra clock speed? All of these questions remain to be seen and also how AIBs are going to tackle this as well. Furthermore, he did mention Turbo Boost 4. There was no details about this, just simply Turbo Boost 4. Now, this does tie in with other rumors and leaks from a while ago that NVIDIA were looking to be a lot more aggressive and basically keep the clock speeds considerably higher, so more stable and higher compared to that of Pascal, which is impressive because Pascal wasn't exactly a slouch when it came to boosting. What does this mean? Well, ultimately, we don't know yet. It's possible, though, that the GPUs might be just more aggressive when it comes to clock gating. It's possible that they might be just better at operating at higher uh, levels of uh, heat. It's possible they just might be better at being a running cooler and possibly just better at overall maintaining a higher clock frequency. Obviously, the higher the clock frequency, the better the performance of the GPU. I'm curious to see how all of this is going to impact things such as RAM as well, though. And now let's discuss Intel from the perspective of 14nm, and not in the way you may be thinking. So Intel's 14nm process is being stretched to the limits. And no, I don't mean in terms of the optimization of the raw performance of the processor, instead in a very different way. We are actually referring to the capability of the manufacturing of these processors. In other words, they can't make enough of the darn things because so many of their products are currently being fabbed on the 14nm process. So in short, Intel are having this issue where they just can't actually have enough manufacturing ability to put out enough products. The CEO of Acer, Jensen Chen, said that there's going to be a tight supply of Intel's 14nm processors and it will pose a significant challenge to the supply chain management cap capability of brand vendors. And, is, and furthermore, the president of laptop original design manufacturer ODM, Kumpal Electronics, his name is C.P. Wong, has said that the largest variable PC market sales in the second half of 2018 will indeed be Intel's supply of these processors. Now, you're immediately going to say, well, dude, what the hell? Uh, aren't Intel releasing the Z390 chipset, which is going to be on the 14nm processor? Aren't they going to release these little-known processors known as the ninth generation CPUs, which of course includes the 8-core 16-thread processor? Indeed, they are. So what does that mean? Does that mean that these processors are going to be hard to procure, let's say, this half of the year? Does that mean that we're going to see retailers a gouge in pricing? Or does that mean it doesn't really make that much of a difference because what Intel are going to do would be to shift their manufacturing capabilities towards specific SKUs that they feel is going to be uh, incredibly important to them to be competitive. After all, the ninth generation processors, at least theoretically, would be one of their priorities. It would allow Intel, at least temporarily, to take the performance crown from AMD in a very convincing way in the 8-core processor segment. Of course, there is the argument that uh, Intel's processors are going to be considerably more expensive than, let's say, the 2700X. I mean, you can check the prices of those, and they're darn cheap. There's a couple of links, by the way, which are in the video description, which you can check out 
There are affiliate links, but if you're thinking about buying a processor, it's a good way to help us out on the channel. Don't feel you have to, I'm just letting you know. But still, the price of the 2700X, the 2600X, and so on and so on is really good. So it's going to be interesting to see how all of this uh, transpires, particularly given, once again, Intel and their gosh darn limitations of the 14NM process. And now let's discuss Whiskey Link. So Whiskey Lake is a bit of an odd duck when it comes to Intel's processor lineup. I've not discussed it much, but it's of course a high performance mobility type of processor. Requires a little power, but is pretty impressive given the TDP and wattage. But that's not the focus of this topic. Instead, the fact that it has certain mitigations for the security vulnerabilities that have been plaguing Intel. We have discussed many of them over the last several months, of course, one of the more infamous and recent ones is Dirac. And he, of course, is the guy responsible for OpenBSD. I'm putting that rather mildly. And he has gone on record and said that he would advise people to actually avoid Intel's processors. And I said that you should actually disable SMT on Intel processors because of the security risks. And, well, he hasn't exactly been casting the company in a positive light. But Whiskey Lake does actually contain some mitigations for the security vulnerabilities, and this has actually been discovered over at Anandek. Curiously though, Amber Lake processors do not contain these security mitigations. So it's going to be interesting to see how all of this compares and what we're going to be seeing. So what we have here, thanks to Anantec's uh, breakdown, is the fact that Meltdown Variant 3 will be fixed in hardware for both Whiskey and Cascade Lake. It's got an advantage on Cascade Lake, which is going to be hardware. On Whiskey Lake, it's going to be firmware and OS only. Uh, but every other way, Cascade Lake is looking to be rather impressive. It is a shame, though, that Variant 2 is not mitigated in hardware. The reason behind that is because it's the most uh, intensive. It's the thing that impacts performance the most. So it's a real shame that Whiskey Lake could not actually have this vulnerability baked into the silicon, but it is what it is. And finally, we're going to discuss Intel and their graphics card of the future, at least when it comes to the support of display technologies. We know that the company are teasing the GPU to be launched in 2020. We don't know a lot about it. Although from what we can figure out, it's most likely going to be focused on gaming and there's probably going to be some variant for service anyway. But for now, it looks like the company are firmly aiming at gaming. And there's a really interesting thing that's popping around the internets right now from Chris Hook, who of course recently joined Intel after a rather lengthy stint at AMD. In a conversation with Chris Hook, a Redditor has actually discovered that Intel are definitely interested in supporting adaptive sync technology with their upcoming graphics cards. Now, this is major for a couple of reasons. The first is that it's really good news for people who want to adopt Intel's, pro uh, Intel's processors and graphics cards because, well, it just makes sense. It means that the display technology is going to come down in price. It's also really good if you want to own an Intel GPU and then you want to migrate to an AMD GPU and vice versa. It's also going to be interesting because it's going to put pressure on NVIDIA. I'm curious to see how NVIDIA will respond to this and if they're also going to be more willing to adopt this open technology. If it would, it would be absolutely amazing for, of course, gamers. But in the short term anyway, I actually applaud Intel's commitment to this and I really look forward to seeing what the company are going to deliver. Let's assume, for sake of argument, it's not massively better than what NVIDIA are putting out, what AMD are putting out. That doesn't matter, even if it's just an option. That's great. Back in the day, we had 3D effects, we had ATI, we had NVIDIA, we had Matrox, and so on and so on. And it was a great time in the GPU market. I'm not saying that I expect things to be going to that level. I'm sure one or two of these companies are always going to rise to the top, but that's cool. In my opinion, it's just great for us as consumers. With all of that said, hopefully you have enjoyed the video. I'll see you soon. Take care. Bye for now.